I'd like to declare the Committee of Council open at uh, meeting open at 5.30pm on the 20th of August. Um, I'd like to declare that the, uh, the meeting of the committee um, is being streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that any audio or visual recording is being taken at this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you made to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or publicly or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside Australia. Uh, Council acknowledges that we're meeting on traditional country with the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and that we pay respect to all past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and we acknowledge their continuing importance to the Ghana people working today. Um, apologies um, and leave of absence. We have Neil. Um, confirmation of the minutes, if I can have someone move to confirm. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Seconded by Councillor Kira. Any discussion or debate on those items? Okay, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Um, we'll move on to um, item four. Uh, especially, specifically item 4.1, exclusion to the public to consider um, item 5.1, strategic procurement matter. If I can have a mover. Thank you, Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Kira. Any debate on the confidentiality? Councillor Martin? No. Nope. Sorry. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just Any debate on the confidentiality? I said Councillor Martin. Oh, yes, actually. Okay. I will, uh, in the absence of that, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? Never seem to be surprised. Um, okay, for us, any members of the public or staff that are not directly related to this item to please exit the room. Um, we are looking uh, roughly for about 20 to 30 minutes uh, to deal with this item. After that, we will be opening back to the public and resuming our agenda for the meeting. Thank you.
So, members, we are moving on to item 7.1. Sorry, apologies, 6.1. And we're going back to our uh, live cam. Yeah. Excellent. So, members, with regards to item 6.1, we have a presentation tonight at this committee for the climate change risks. And I'd like to invite our external speakers, so Sarah Barker from Mint Ellison and also David Power from our audit committee, our audit committee chair. Welcome to both of you. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. We look forward to, uh, to your presentation. Um, just as part of the presentation tonight, um, members will be asking some questions after the presentation is concluded. Uh, so by all means, if you can entertain that, that would be great. Thank you. <laughs> Over the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for the welcome. And uh, I believe I've got control of this as well. So I don't really need to see a lot on the agenda. But we'll move right into it. Um, we're limited with time, so we'll uh, hit the key topics. Um, this is a topic that's certainly uh, very much emerging uh, across many um, cycles. Certainly, um, you know, federal government, state government, local governments have in, in a big way. And, um, literally, was at a session only yesterday with uh, the Resilient South group with Onkaparinga Council, Marion Council, getting a report back on how their progress is going. Um, Adelaide Hills Council doing a lot of interesting work in this area. Uh, and clearly, you, you as a council have obviously been very well aware of climate change for a number of years, uh, but it's very much becoming more than just an environmental risk, but very much a an emerging financial risk, and so that's why it gets a, a guernsey at the Board of Risk Committee, uh, and so that's why we're presenting to you tonight. We certainly see it as a key strategic risk that we need to identify and manage, and um, certainly uh, it's, it's clearly not just environmental. I think historically it's been always thought of it like that, but it's a financial risk as well. It certainly has a potential to impact on property values as well. Um, there was discussion about how uh, climate risk is having a really big impact on properties in Queensland yesterday, uh, and uh, you know to the point where you can't even get insurance on some of those properties. So we're getting to the point where that's going to have an impact, and therefore that could have an impact on rates as well. Um, there will be new initiatives. There will be things that we need to be budgeting for in our long-term financial plan on initiatives on on how we can. Um, have rectification projects, um, impacts on long-term financial planning, um, you know, alternate road surfaces, additional greening, all those kinds of things we'll need to be looking at. Uh, and also has an impact on things like asset management plans, so we need to be thinking about that in our planning for the assets that we actually do uh, currently uh, manage. Um, what do we do from an environmental and greening point of view uh, in relation to the impact of climate change? Um, uh, as we um, commit to things like uh, carbon mutual targets, um, that will have an impact as well on what that means from a cost perspective. Um, and we're, we're seeing that already, um, that uh, climate change risk is uh, is now on the on the uh, Shreya watch list for your own council and. Um, it is. Uh, it will certainly, um, as we do more detailed risk assessment, um, will come in. Will create a number of uh, operational risks as well. In terms of financial opportunities, I think we just want to. You know, I like to think of risk as not just being bad things, but also opportunities. Um, so you know, there are potential for if you get these things right for lower insurance premiums if you can demonstrate um, climate resilience. Uh, there's likely to be opportunities for favourable interest rates or avoiding uh, penalty interest on borrowings if you get these things right. Sarah's going to talk about some of that. Um, there's opportunities too for cost sharing, so we don't have to do all this ourselves, but there's a lot of moves um, amongst other councils who have done work in this space. Resilient South is a good example with Onka, Pringa, Marion and what they're doing along the coast. Uh, Adelaide Hills, Mount Barker, and a number of other councils are doing interesting work in the space. So, 
um, please don't think that we have to do all that ourselves and there's opportunities to spin off the LGA as well and find the things that they're doing. Uh, and then also engagement with the South Australian government and developers to ensure that climate change is being considered in things like development plans. So again, that we share the cost with, with developers. Um, there's also a great opportunity to proactively engage with our residents uh, and understand local climate risks and support their initiatives to reduce emissions as well um, so that we can do our best to reduce the impact of, of climate change risks um, on, on the city. Um, there's also some obligations that are coming uh, in relation to AASB practice statement two. So climate related risks uh, and other emerging risk disclosures are required. So entities preparing financial statements in the course of the Australian scans will need to consider whether investors could reasonably expect that emerging risks, including climate change risks, could affect the amounts and disclosures reported in financial statements. So ongoing, uh, there will be a greater focus on that. And in fact, there have been some companies that have been fined for not disclosing this kind of information. So ultimately, we'll get to that stage where we become a requirement uh, at a local government level as well. Um, and if it becomes material, then it, then it clearly has a something that has to be considered in our financial statements. And we would expect the auditors to be asking the same questions. You know, have we properly disclosed? the impact of climate change on our financial statements. So that's just, um, I guess, the things that are really hitting us at, a, um, at an audit committee level where we're considering these, this space. It's very much the emerging risk across other local governments that I'm dealing with as well. Um, but I'm actually um, now going to have the pleasure of introducing to you Sarah, Sarah Bate Parker from um, Minta Ellison, and uh, I'll pass over to her this bit, which is you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me back. Um, I know it's my, it's not the first time that some of you have uh, seen me speak, but it's always a pleasure to come back to council and to work with Michelle's team. So I'm going to talk to you about climate change very much through a finance and liability lens. As of you who have spoken with me before know that I don't care about environmental issues or the community. This is all about money for me. And that hasn't changed in one bit. So I'm going to talk to you about the three financial categories of financial risk associated with climate change that the Bank of England uses. So the Bank of England talks about the physical risks associated with climate change, which are those environmental issues that airlines first go to. But then we are increasingly talking about the economic transition risks associated with climate change. So these are the responses of financial markets and the real economy to the threats associated with climate change, rather than the environmental impacts themselves. And then finally, my favourite topic, liability consequences associated with climate change. And as we go through, you'll see these are not issues that council can defer until the next electoral cycle, let alone out to 2030. These are issues that manifest right now within the short term and certainly within mainstream investment horizons. So to start with, I'm going to do a little bit of a 101 and I do apologise to those of you who, who do work in this space a lot, but it helps to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So what is climate change? I'm sure you've all heard of the greenhouse effect and that's quite descriptive of the way that climate change occurs. It refers to the layer of gas that we have in the atmosphere called greenhouse gas which comprises six major gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. And it occurs naturally. We need this layer of gas. It's been there far longer than humans have been there. And it's got a very important function of stopping heat from within the Earth's atmosphere from radiating out into space. So we need it, otherwise we'd have a climate more akin to that of Mars. The issue with climate change has been, of course, that since the Industrial Revolution, what humankind has been doing is digging up solidified forms of these gases, like coal and oil, and combusting them, converting them into their gaseous form, and at the same time chucking a whole stack of cows and sheep and pigs that burn the and methane all over the landscape, and chopping down great swathes of forest, which acts as nature's way of regulating the amount of these gases that hit the atmosphere. And so as a consequence, we've been hyper-dumping excesses of these gases into the atmosphere. So this layer of greenhouse gas has been getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And as we know on days like this, what do we do when we get cold? We put on a thicker blanket because it keeps us warmer and traps more heat. And that's what's been happening, happening with climate change. 
industrial deposition of excesses of the gas in the atmosphere has made our blanket a lot thicker. And as a consequence, we're already experiencing global average temperatures in excess of 1.1 degrees centigrade warmer than where we were prior to the Industrial Revolution. Now, scientists tell us that by the end of this century, if we keep emitting the way that we are, we're looking at in excess of 4 degrees centigrade warmer than where we are prior to the Industrial Revolution. To put that in context, the last ice age we had as a planet was less than 4 degrees cooler than where we are now. So it represents a fundamental shift in the entire way that the ecology of the Earth operates. Why do we care about that? Well, we often talk about the catastrophic impacts of climate change, whether they be uh, extreme catastrophic in the sense of more frequent and extreme natural disasters, but also the gradual onset. <laughs> so to illustrate that, I've got uh, a couple of charts there that you can see. The one on the left-hand side is a nice symmetrical, normally distributed bell curve that illustrates global average temperature dis distribution in 1900. And you can see that with the coloured dots down the bottom, the blue on the left and the red on the right, illustrates the variation of global temperatures from that average. So it's quite contained between plus and minus 2 degrees centigrade. The chart on the right shows where we are now. So not only has the curve shifted demonstrably to the right in terms of the warming temperatures, the distribution's changed a lot. There's a lot more in the fat tail. There's a lot more variation. So we're now seeing variation in global temperatures between a range of minus three and a half and plus five and a half. From a financial point of view, that kind of variation means uncertainty. And uncertainty, of course, means risk. So what does it mean for the City of Adelaide? What kind of impacts are we experiencing, already experiencing, that are compounding as climate change gets, gets worse? Well, of course, we know about heat waves and extreme temperatures, more and more extreme temperatures which impact on the most vulnerable in our society, the very old, the very, very young. We're experiencing a lot more drought, but conversely, we're experiencing a lot more flooding. How, how does that add up? It's because climate change changes the nature of precipitation patterns. So instead of having that nice, uh, predictable rain in winter and spring, we get far less predictable, yet really heavy downpours. And that's really from a, from a local government perspective, where our stormwater and sewage infrastructure has a lot of trouble coping with those kind of extreme downpours. And we're already seeing those observations in terms of the, the, the number of extreme heat days, which really impact on the city. So from my position as a corporate lawyer and an institutional invest, investor, the question for me is what, not what impact this has on the community. I don't care about that. For me, it's what does this mean for your financial position? What does it mean for your position as far as insurance and reinsurance goes? What does it mean for your ability to continue to collect rates, to continue to provide the services that you are obliged to provide under statute? What does it mean for rates, roads and rubbish? And that's the question I really did want to explore for you today because the impacts on the City of Adelaide are going to be unique. We know that there are all these climate risk impacts, but how they then manifest in terms of their impact on the city, on the people in the city, on the infrastructure in the city, in your assets is going to be unique. And as an extra layer of complication, how those unique impacts then themselves impact on your financial position, your insurances and your liability exposures is going to be unique as well. So let's look at that. What does it mean for your financial position and your liability position? And just as an entree to that, I just wanted to invite you to think about Townsville. It's always nice to be able to laugh at quotes on it. So um, this is a chart that was um, developed by Willis Ray, one of the largest reinsurers in the world, um, after the Townsville floods in, in February. Now, obviously a devastating impact on the Townsville area. Putting to one side the fact that the three communities that were hardest hit, Railway Estate, Rossley and Adalia, were new build residential estates, built on floodplains, on bends in the river, 
on concrete slab housing, putting that to one side. What does that event mean for the economy in Townsville? And to get some kind of as idea of the scale, we've already had the government come out and say that it's caused in excess of one and a half billion dollars worth of damage to property. Now, that in and of itself is terrible. But if we think about it in terms of the 2011 floods that hit Brisbane, they cost six and a half billion dollars worth of damage to property. But they cost 7.1 billion dollars worth of damage to social fabric in terms of mental health, in terms of family breakdown, in terms of suicides. So when we're thinking about these financial impacts of climate change and what they mean for council, it's not just on damage to property. There are far more secondary and tertiary impacts in terms of what it means for your communities. So how are markets reacting to this? How are markets reacting to the fact that at the moment we are in that grey area? We, the way that we are emitting as a global economy translates to more than four degrees of global warming by the end of the century. The scientists tell us we need to get down into that light green area down the bottom, well below two degrees above pre-industrial averages. And to do that, the entire global economy needs to decarbonise by 2050, within the next 30 years. So how are markets facing up to that challenge? And this is where the economic transition risks come into it. So economic transition risks, again, the Bank of England gives us three convenient categories to look at those. These are the market responses to those threats associated with climate change. So policy and regulatory responses, like the carbon tax that we had and then didn't have, like technological developments, like shifting social preferences and market stakeholder expectations. Now, these are the ones that in recent years are really, really starting to snowball, pardon the pun. So policy and regulatory responses, we know now globally there's now more than 800 councils that have um, declared a climate emergency, for example. In the last six weeks, we've had... <laughs> not, this one. not this one. Okay, don't mention the war. Um, in the last six weeks, we have had uh, the UK being the first G7 country to legislate a net zero emissions target for their economy by 2050. It's not a target, actually, it's in law. New Zealand did the same a few weeks before that. Interestingly, they separate out, separate out their zero carbon from their biogenic methane because they would have no economy if they didn't have cows and sheep, but they're still targeting a reduction of 43% on biogenic methane by 2050. These are the responses of government to this threat rather than the ecological impacts themselves. And it's all been driven by the Paris Agreement, which was this agreement in Paris in 2015 where 196 countries across the world, everyone except Syria and Nicaragua, has agreed in the necessity of keeping global warming to well below two degrees above pre-industrial averages and that 196 countries will all introduce their own policies that are consistent with meeting that goal including Australia. And that also includes that goal of net zero in the second half of the century. So that's policy and regulatory responses. How about technological developments? Things like your Tesla battery. Of course, this isn't the world wildlife fund trying to solve climate change. This is Elon Musk coming in and going, how do I make money? I've got a Tesla. You'll never go back once you've driven an electric car. I love it, I love it. Um, and developments in battery storage. These are, as I say, this is the way that markets work. People innovate, they improve, and they try and make money. And this is what we're seeing in response to these issues associated with climate change. To combine a policy and a technological, we've now got countries around the world that represent more than 40% of the world's cars who have announced a ban on the sale of cars with internal combustion engines between 2022 and 2040. Scandinavians, of course, closer to 2022, but then if we look at the other countries involved, the UK, France, South Korea, India, China, <coughs> they've all announced bans <coughs> on the sale of cars with internal combustion engines, 40% of the world's car markets. So this shift is on, well and truly on. And then finally, shifting social preferences and stakeholder expectations. So at one end of the chain, we've got the community. 
things like single-use plastics. How quickly has that shifted in terms of community attitudes to single-use plastics? Plastic being made from oil, which is a fossil fuel. Once these things tip, they move so quickly. Then at the other end of the spectrum, the old crusty end, I'm allowed to say that because I one, we have the institutional investment money that has shifted. David mentioned the changes to our accounting standards. Just last week, we had a new regulatory guide issued by ASIC, RG247, or an amendment to that guide, which is the, the guide that governs the narrative disclosures in your financial statements, where they now explicitly say you need to take climate change into account. We've got institutional investors. Now, obviously, the City of Adelaide doesn't have shareholders, but this is demonstrative of how markets are changing and shifting. The largest investors in the world are worried about climate change, not because they care about polar bears, but because they care about their ability to continue to earn money. And they are now all advocating for companies in which they invest to disclose and analyse their material climate-related financial risks by reference to recommendations of the Task Force from Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, the TCFT. This is a framework that um, encourages you to do stress testing and scenario planning on a forward-looking basis. Because all we do know about climate change is that the past has no bearing on what the future's going to look like. So what they're saying is, we don't need you to pick a point. We don't need you to make predictions. But what we do need you to do is to demonstrate to us that you understand the spectrum of plausible risk. One end of the spectrum, everyone complies with their Paris Agreement for targets, happy days, we limit global warming to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial averages. That necessitates a hell of a lot of economic transition risk because it necessitates the entire global economy decarbonising within 30 years. What does that mean for council? Other end of the spectrum, this is as usual from an economic transition point of view, bakes in four degrees plus of global warming by the end of the century. What does that mean for council? What does that mean for your physical risks? Credit ratings agencies are starting to get onto this as well, and they're starting with sub-sovereigns. So state and local governments, because they understand that you've got a hell of a lot of the infrastructure assets and not much of the revenue. So they're rebating their books. It's interesting to see that the first pass that uh, Standard & Poor's, for example, puts when it's re-rating its sovereigns in relation to climate change, three criteria, percentage of population living below five metres from sea level, we don't do so well on that one, agriculture and extractives as a share of GDP, not so bad for the city of Adelaide, but for South Australia and Australia more broadly, not so good. And then the third criteria is basically how rich are we uh, as, a, as a country or as a jurisdiction so that we can throw money at the problem to fix it once disaster strikes. We do do well on that one. Happy days. The banks are starting to get on board. This is an extract from the annual report of the Commonwealth Bank, not its sustainability report, its annual report. That map of Australia there represents the consolidation of its analysis of all 2 million properties <coughs> in its residential mortgage portfolio. If you've got a Commonwealth Bank mortgage, your house is in this analysis. It's gone down to a five by five metre grid. It can tell the difference between the risk to your property and the one next door. And it's analysed what the uplift in physical risk associated with climate change in every single one of those houses is. To coastal inundation, freshwater flooding, increasing bushfire risk, increasing wind shear risk, and the one that really surprised them is causing the most financial risk and damage to their portfolio, soil contraction. Because when soils dry out, particularly clay soils, they contract, messes with everyone's foundations. So the question now is, what are they going to do with that information? How are they going to start differentially pricing? And that has started to occur. So I think last time I was here, we talked a bit about green bonds because a lot of the things that that local government does is inherently considered sustainable because it's around public infrastructure, public transport and things like that. So often if you're, if you're issuing debt instruments, you can call them a green bond. So 2018, now it's all about sustainable, sustainability linked loans or positive incentive facilities. So what we're seeing out of Europe now is where banks will lend 
just for general commercial purposes. Unlike green bonds, you don't need a specific sustainable project. Just for general commercial purposes, they will lend. And every year they review your progress against predetermined sustainability targets. If you hit them, you'll get three basis points off your loan. If you miss them, you'll get a three basis point penalty. So this is financial markets drawing a direct causal monetary link between sustainability performance and lowering your default risk. And knowing everything that Michelle and her team has been working on, it'd be laid down as air to get the benefits of these kinds of loans because the, the kind of criteria that they tie, are tied to is everything that you're doing already. So I see a real opportunity here for council to actually start leveraging what you are doing into lowering your cost of capital. In terms of liability and insurance, this is all about constituents whinging. Just as much it is about your technical legal obligations. If people lose money, if people's homes are devalued, they look for someone to blame. And a lot of this stuff isn't insurable. So we're seeing a real uptick in planning appeals driven by climate change. So for example, when was the last time your land subject to inundation mapping was done? What data was it based on? Was it historical or was it prospective looking? These are all the issues that we now need to grapple with to make sure that, that the council in particular is protecting itself against future claims. And I know that it's <coughs> the second you change any of the zones, the developers crack it. So it's, it's, it's not a, you know, an easy solution, any of this, but it's got to be done. Boundary adjustments, public resumption of land. We're seeing a lot of that in the US, particularly where there's a riverine flooding, where councils are actually starting to buy the riverfront properties and demolishing them and using them as a natural buffer for the rest of the properties behind them against flooding. We're seeing negligence and nuisance claims where a failure to update um, municipalities own infrastructure that it owns has impact on the private properties around them. So we've talked before about the case uh, following Hurricane Sandy in Illinois, where the insurers who paid out for stormwater damage for homeowners and businesses there, the insurance company then turned around and sued 12 local councils in negligence and said, you caused our loss. It was your failure to update your storage and stormwater infrastructure to what you knew or should have known were the extreme precipitation patterns in 2012 as a result of climate change, as opposed to the 60s when we built the pipes. That's what caused our loss. So we're seeing this pattern of the insurers trying to put their responsibility at the feet of who controls the infrastructure. Force majeure, this is the get out of jail free for acts of God clause of the lawyers chuck at the back of all your contracts. Can't just chuck the boilerplate in anymore. What is now an unforeseeable act of God? The envelope for that is so narrow in a climate context now. And at the same time, the standard of care that is expected in terms of what are reasonable responses to these risks that are, are foreseeable is getting higher and higher and higher. I'll leave you to, to read this. I know you'll have it in your papers. This, this, this is shouted for it at its highest. The South Australian Government, of course, commissioned the Murray Darling Basin Royal Commission, which hit a couple of days before the Banking Royal Commission, so it didn't really get much publicity. But the conclusions of, of that Royal Commission were stark in terms of a failure to take climate risk into account being negligent. Negligence in three aspects. First of all, assuming that you can kick the can down the road and consider climate change just in your next strategic um, uh, planning window in 10 years time, negligent. Using historical flood data and water flow data as the basis for your planning decisions, negligent. Failure to take the most up-to-date science into account, negligent. I've never seen such florid and blunt language being used in relation to any decision in my entire life as is in this Murray-Darling Basin Authority decision. If you ever 
having trouble sleeping, I said, just reading chapter five. And insurance is getting harder to come by. That map I showed from the Commonwealth Bank's annual report, all the insurers are doing the same analysis. If you can't get insurance, you can't get a mortgage. If you can't get a mortgage on your house, you're not going to be able to sell it. And so there's this huge financial stability concern now about how climate change can impact on insurance and then lending and then the housing market. So what does it mean that you should do? Obviously, it's something that's going to be unique to council. But the first thing I would recommend is to reconsider how robust your scenarios and assumptions that you use across everything that you do in policy and planning. How robust are they? Talk about that later. That's just a chart that shows Melbourne's going to run out of water by 2028. Happy days, even when the desal plant's turned on. What's next for you? As I say, that piece of work really needs to be done to consider okay, what are the unique impacts on the city of Adelaide? What does it mean for our unique infrastructure, our unique real estate? And then how does that translate into financial risks and opportunities mm -hmm. for us as a council? Excellent. I think everyone's quite captivated. <laughs> <laughs> Members, um, got any questions to uh, Sarah or David? Jesse. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the uh, presentation. Much appreciated. Um, look, um, listening to that talk, uh, some of the things that, that come to mind are uh, uh, are really about uh, practicalities and, and reality. One of the things uh, is uh, is the, the fact that Australia's emissions profile, um, changing Australia's emissions profile, uh, at the moment realistically does not seem to, uh, relative to the big emitters, particularly China, India and the US, uh, seem to make any difference. Um, in your evaluation, have you actually looked at the uh, scenario for for the future, given given that, uh, for example, Australia. I understand. Actually, I just saw an article that said, you know, Australia's emissions uh, for an entire year uh, is emitted by China in in eighteen days. Mm -hmm. So, is there is there a realistic appraisal out there of the reality that this is global warming? You know, it's not local warming, uh, and that we could shut down our all our industries, shut down all our emissions tomorrow, uh, and China will replicate all of Australia within a few days. Yeah, and, and it's true that we are responsible for only one and a half percent of the world's emissions. Although if you take into account our scope three emissions, which is the combustion of our coal in particular overseas, 15%. So it's it's a lot more outsized than, than, than what we usually talk about. Can, can, but, I, can, I, can I just ask where you get that from? 15% of the world's emissions come from comes from the Australian, combustion of Australian, Australian coal. coal and gas. Where, where, where do you get that from? Uh, can't tell you off the top of my head, okay. but it is if you if you look, for example, at the annual reports of all the resources companies, and you look at their disclosures of scope one and two emissions, which is coming from their operations versus their scope three, the scope three are in an order of magnitude of between twelve and twenty times as high because most of the emissions from from these activities don't come from actually digging it out of the ground; it comes from burning it. So, but that that whole argument around well, we're only responsible, let's say, for one and a half percent, so whatever we do doesn't matter. That only holds if you're looking at climate change as purely an environmental risk issue. Because as far as markets are concerned, you've got all these adaptation risks. So fine, we can go, even if we shut down coal tomorrow, or we kept going with coal, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the views of the banks and the insurance companies about what our exposures are, what government's exposures are, and what you need to be doing to mitigate the risks of climate change impacting on you, not just your impact on climate change. So when you're looking at it through an economic lens, we've got to look at, well, what does it mean? in terms of impact on us, not just our contribution to the problem. So, Councillor Kerr, one more question, then Councillor yeah. Sims and Councillor Hyde. Thanks. Thank you for that response. Um, the, the other question is that what, what seems to be omitted, uh, I'm just wondering in your investigations, uh, in terms of risks to people, uh, do you evaluate the risk to uh, vulnerable people, so the elderly, uh, the poor, the unemployed, of poor and ill-conceived Government, uh, government policies and response to climate change, because that seems to be an emission. A clear example would be uh, the 
uh, if, if it, almost destruction of the electricity grid, uh, a poorly thought out phase out of, uh, of uh, reliable coal baseload. Um, and the result that you have uh, elderly people who can no longer afford uh, to switch on the air conditioning when it's, uh, when it's hot in summer. Do you consider that impact? Because we sort of hear a lot about the fear, the danger of uh, you know, climate change and ordering folk, but we don't hear about the risks of poor knee-jerk government policy. Oh, absolutely. And I could wax lyrically for hours and hours about the failures of governments, both stripes, federal, state and local, on this. But we are where we are. And it's much better to have a situation like you do here in South Australia, say in Wyala, where they're grabbing the bull by the horns and they're looking at renewable energy as an opportunity to reinvigorate the entire town versus somewhere like down in the Latrobe Valley where I'm from in Victoria, where you've got a close, closing down of the Hazelwood power station, where there is nothing, nothing, no transition plan in place. And it's caused a lot of damage to the community. I absolutely take your point, but it's not going to help anyone if we stick our heads in the sand on it and just consider that, well, we're going to keep doing this because that's what we've always done and we're really good at it. Because what happens in 20 years time when the coal industry falls off a cliff? We need to start, I absolutely agree, thinking about this in a far more proactive way and looking at that kind of just transition. Because markets aren't fair. Markets don't care. Markets change. How long have we had these things for? 10 years? Who had a 3210? Nokia 3210 before that? Yeah! Still <laughs> <laughs> on! Hardest things ever. But you know, how, how, how well do you think it worked for, for Nokia in, in New Zealand to say, you know what, well, we're really good at making 3210, so we're going to keep doing it because we're worried about people losing their jobs. Markets don't care. They move. Well, when the youngest councillor in the room has the oldest phone in the room, <laughs> we, have, we have hope. Is that, is that like hipster hope? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> councillor Sims. Thanks very much um, for your presentation. It was uh, sobering, but also really interesting. So thank you. I just wanted to flesh out the um, issues you raised about uh, property values um, a bit more um, and, and talking about you know, property values in the city. And you mentioned that they're going to decline as a result of climate change. Is that um, largely due to changing temperature? And I'm assuming fire risk, um, and I saw Four Corners last night, I'm not sure if you no. caught it. Um, it was looking at um, apartments and the apartment industry around, yeah. around the country and how they're you know, vulnerable to fire and a range of other issues. I was wondering whether climate change is something that's going to particularly target city apartments and the impact of extreme heat in terms of livability and those kind of things. Is that what you're talking about when you're talking about the value of the properties? Yeah, and, and, and I'm certainly not a, a building engineer, so I'm, I'm not qualified to talk about the, the impact of climate change on any particular building. But if you look at the work that the banks are doing, they are looking at how these uh, issues have a compounding impact on the structural integrity of buildings. Same with the insurers. Now, it is a term of your mortgage that you have insurance. So we don't talk about buildings being uninsurable, we talk about buildings having unaffordable insurance. And if you're looking at, if you've got a $600,000 property and it's costing you $70,000 a year to insure, it's effectively uninsurable because people can't afford to pay it. And so I think the issue with, with all of these um, concerns is, both how climate change is going to impact, but more immediately, how financial markets are going to start sending the signals. Now, my hope is that the banks are taking all this data that they have and saying, right, it's not in our interest for property markets to collapse. So now that we have this, this data, what can we do to work with our customers, whether it's a form of long loans or, or whatever else, to help them to build resilience into their property? before it hits and so they don't go so they can still pay their mortgage because it's not in, in the bank's interest for people to default but then you look at say Europe for example where they're already starting to differentially price uh, mortgages not based on the physical exposures of the properties but based on their energy efficiency 
because the logic there being, well, if your home is energy efficient, all else being equal, you pay less on your power bills, you have less pressure to retrofit your property to be more energy efficient to comply with new requirements, and therefore you have more money left over to pay your mortgage. So more and more we're seeing these financial signals. And as I say, my hope is that the banks and, and it's certainly in their interest to work with the community to develop resilience rather than just start picking off those five percent of properties that they're particularly worried about being vulnerable. Thank you. Councillor Hope. Thank you for ruining my day. <laughs> um, uh, no, it was highly informative uh, and appreciate it. Uh, I suppose we're looking at that next steps thing up there. Um, it all seems a little bit muddled, but, uh, and this is, I suppose, for everyone, um, uh, all three of you over there. Um, what are tangibly the next steps? Um, how long is it going to take to achieve the next stage of the work that needs to be done? And how much money is it going to cost? Read the chair. I thought that question would come. So, um, in uh, last year, we spoke to council and uh, indicated we would be doing this climate risk work. It's in um, the integrated business plan. So, within my team, so um, we have um, allocation of about fifty thousand dollars specifically to do this climate risk work. We are actually have approached the LGA mutual liability scheme to see whether they may or actually co-funded to reduce our cost. Um, so we are starting this, we have a project plan um, and it basically um, is it commencing over the next couple of months. We will bring the findings um, back into council uh, to look at how we then look at the corporate risk register, uh, what it might mean for the long-term financial plan, strategic planning, asset management plans. Etc. So if this will come back to council, you can see up on that slide um, the recommendations um, and findings around June 20, uh, and then coming back to, to council. Thank you. Thanks. I suppose. Um, oh, so I'm assuming we're the only council doing this work. In no, 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 no. How far advanced are we relative to other councils? Yeah. And is, sorry, is the LGA helping those councils out as well? Um, so through through the chair, um, as part of uh, Resilient East, we're one of eight councils that work to get on climate um, adaptation. There are four regions within metropolitan areas. So um, David has previously spoken about the work that um, the Southern Councils and the, the uh, Hills uh, are doing. We, my team works very closely with them and building on the work that they do. The difference for us is we do have significant financial and property assets that some of those councils don't do. So um, I would say that our work is perhaps diving deeper into those types of risks. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillors, any other questions? David, Sarah, thank you very much for your presentation today. Very informative, thank you. Councillor Sims was right or wrong? <laughs> I always am. <laughs> Moving on to item um, seven, uh, we're dealing with item 7.1, the lot 14 renewal, um, tree uh, removal. Uh, Lord Mayor. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, I, I would like to um, ask for this item to be deferred um, purely and simply so that we can actually be briefed properly. Um, just can I get a before you, that's what your motion is, uh, Lord Mayor, just to uh, defer the item? Yeah, I would like yep. to defer. So that. can I have someone second, seconded by Councillor Abraham, is it? Go ahead. Sorry. Lord, um, look, uh, there's been sort of lots of conjecture on this and I've asked for quite a bit of information, which some of which I'm hoping is coming tonight, but um, uh, fair to say, I think in terms of, we haven't been briefed properly in terms of the context, I certainly haven't seen the uh, plans for the redevelopment. Um, 
or understanding how this is the final section, which has sort of come out as I've been asking questions over the last 24 hours of the North Tel uh, Terrace Boulevard development. So I'd like to actually see, I'm, I'm not sure what presentation you may have ready for us tonight, but I certainly would like to actually see a presentation on what we have already done, what the master plan was, how this fits into the last section, and um, whether there's been any uh, attempts to retain those trees. I mean, nobody wants to see those heritage trees gone, but I actually also have read, looking at two different reports now from arborists, so I just want some a bit more information before we make a decision. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillor Abraham said as a seconder. Uh, does anyone wish to speak to the deferral for or against, Councillor Moran? Uh, yes, well, I can understand what the Lord Mayor is saying, but in my mind, this isn't a um, uh, isn't a difficult decision to make. Um, we've got the report that the trees are 100 years old; they're healthy. In Europe, they live for hundreds and hundreds of years, so the 20 years is a rather um, uh, short. Uh, they say they're going to live for another 20 years. Uh, we challenge that. We have. Um, we have uh, trees that are proven to live a lot longer than that. Um, it is. Uh, it doesn't crowd the entrance. It's been. Um, in, they've been on the footpath in front of the busiest hospital in the southern hemisphere for a hundred years, and those multiple patients seem to stumble around them. Um, any. I think for the landscape uh, landscapers to ask for a greenfield site there is um, unreasonable. Um, they're beautiful trees. They're, they're very healthy. Um, so I, I can under, I think understand where the Lord Mayor's coming from in an effort of caution. But um, I don't think I think we know what we what we need to know. They're healthy. They're there. They're on the footpath. They don't obstruct um, any of the new buildings or the new developments in any way. They're just part of the landscape planning. So I'm happy to um, say that we vote against this chainsaw massacre tonight, um, or we get more information and vote against the chainsaw ma massacre in two weeks or three weeks, whenever it is. But I think for us to go, uh, having just heard a climate change um, talk, these trees to be replaced by the same number of trees will take at least 50 to 60 years to replace their carbon footprint. Um, they're valued by the Melbourne um, Tree Valuation um, Method that we I tried to get adopted here, but I don't think we ever used it. Um, at $665,000, the replacement trees, we're certainly not replacing them with $665,000 of carbon, uh, uh, carbon footprint at all. We're just replacing uh, the same number with the same number of saplings. Um, I don't think this is a line ball decision. I, I understand from talking to some of the council they've decided to vote to remove them. I, I, I'm horrified. Um, the government will do what the government does. And Franz, I'm surprised that you still stay in the room with these things. Um, Councillor Moran. Excuse me. Uh, no, it is. It is Councillor Moran. It's my mandated right to point out when I think somebody has a conflict of no. interest. No, Councillor. Yes, no, no, Councillor. Please, Councillor Moran. I'm councillors. I'm chairing the, the meeting. Councillor Moran, please stick to the debate. I expect that if this vote went through tonight, that it would be to chop trip down the trees, and I can understand the Lord Mayor's reticence to um, to not have more information to justify one way or the other. And I'm certainly not criticising her at all. Um, the best outcome is to say no to the government, so we don't have sap on our hands. Uh, a second best would be to go along with Sandy's referral. Um, so the, the absolutely outrageous one for climate change for our city. Councillor, you've, you've would passed your time about 30 seconds ago. Would you like an extension? No, I don't. Thank you. Councillor Sims, followed by Councillor Hyde, followed by Councillor Kerr. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I um, understand where the, the Lord Mayor is coming from in, in terms of wanting more information, but I, I do agree with Councillor Moran. I, I don't just want to see a stay of execution for these trees and have them, you know, kept on death uh, death row for another few weeks. I'd actually like us to resolve the matter tonight and say we are going to save the trees. Um, since this matter uh, first came on the public agenda, I've had lots of feedback from members of the community who are um, alarmed and rightly so about the potential for these trees to be removed and what that means for our um, street escape and, and in particular um, North Terrace, which is a historic part of our city. 
They've been here um, over 100 years. They've survived uh, two world wars. Hopefully they will, they will survive this term of council. Um, I think it would be appalling to see um, trees that have been uh, such a part of our city and our heritage and our history um, being removed simply on the basis of uh, what, what appears to be convenience. Um, and as Councillor Moran has said, um, the trees have been there for a long time. They've been in front of a hospital. There have been people moving and, and going through that area um, over a number of years. It doesn't seem to have um, caused uh, significant issues at that time. So why on earth would we be now um, looking at getting rid of them? And the idea that you simply um, remove them because they've only got 20 years to go in their lifespan seems to me to be a nonsensical argument. Um, and um, we should be uh, protecting these trees. It would take us a very, very long time to uh, get trees of these standards. Um, and, um, you know, to, as Councillor Moran said, we've just heard a presentation talking about um, the alarming implications of climate change for our city. The idea that we would uh, rip up mature trees that provide a huge amount of natural shade um, on one of our city's busiest streets, to me, would be just absolutely absurd. Um, and uh, so I'd like to see us knock this on the head tonight and vote to protect the trees and um, go back to the government and say, no, we're not letting this happen under our watch. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, Councillor Hyde, followed by Councillor Kerr. I just feel very privileged to have an armrest on the council, Councillor Moran. I know she's read a lot of these reports, but um, some of the expert knowledge makes me wonder. Um, uh, I have serious misgivings um, about uh, any tree removal, any removal of healthy trees. Um, equally so, though, I have serious misgivings about going into a decision without the uh, information in front of us around what we're actually what we're actually deciding on now, um, I've made the point to others around this table that there should be no reason that uh, uh, Oxygen, who are the government's um, architects for this uh, Lot 14, uh, rethink. There should be no reason that they can't find a way to pave around the trees. Um, uh, and it's going to take some serious uh, convincing and strong arguments to change my mind otherwise. Nevertheless, I would like to see um, what work has been done on this um, uh, to see where they're at. Uh, and I would like this council to be informed as much so that we can go in uh, with open eyes instead of rushing into a decision one way or the other. Thank you, Councillor Hart. Councillor Kira. Well, thanks, Chair. Um, look, Guy, um, I actually thought the original proposal was quite sensible, to be honest. Um, I think there's, there's a fair bit of emotive language that we're hearing in the chamber here, but we ought to really uh, stay firm and make our decisions based on uh, our best judgment uh, in each case. The trees, we do have an arborist uh, uh, estimate of the lifespan of the trees. That is the expert uh, number we've been given. There is no debate that the trees regardless of what actual uh, number of years are left. There's no debate. The trees are in their final phase of their life. Um, this area is going through a substantial amount of flux uh, of uh, redevelopment. It actually makes sense to replace this. If we're going to replace the trees, as it seems we are going to have to eventually, uh, it makes sense to do it now. Um, the proposal is to replant, is to replace them, not remove trees permanently, but to replace them with uh, plain trees, plain trees which uh, do better than this species in this environment. London plane trees are named because they thrive in a in a in an abject city environment. They will, in the long run, provide a grander tree canopy than what is existing now. Um, and uh, so, so I, I mean, I, I welcome the Lord Mayor's request for a, a deferral. I see nothing wrong with that whatsoever. I mean, let's have more uh, a time and advice by all means. But I do want to stick up for the original proposal uh, against um, a fair bit of emotion that's coming on uh, regarding this matter. So, so I think, um, so I think, yes, let's 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 defer it. But uh, but I but I see at the moment uh, what I see is a fairly sensible proposal. Thank you, Councillor Kira. I've got both Councillor Canole and then Councillor Kiros. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, just to, to also support the deferral, because I think, uh, yes, there was a lot of emotive language and I find it quite you know, distressing 
and uh, I feel somewhat bullied continuously by this sort of stuff, put that aside. Um, there is a lot to know. There is a, there is a, uh, you know, a lot of information that we do not have, I do believe, and we do need to uh, investigate it all because it's not this generation that I'm worried about. I'm worried about the next. And if we do have old trees and they are in decline, I mean, they do need to be looked after. That comes at expense. We are replacing them apparently with 20 trees, not 10. Um, you know, mature. So there is there is some effort there. But there's all uh, you know, there's a lot of other information. I think we should be looking at, but that should be provided to all of us. And I think that's quite important for us to make a good uh, you know decision. That will be something not just about this generation, which most of us won't see. You know, this current tree is out anyway. Uh, you know, but the next generation who rely on us doing things in a timely fashion uh, is important. And it is, you know, our boulevard that we're talking about. It's not just this section. This is the last section. And uh, it is important we, we link that all together in, in a very you know, rational way and that it, it does suit. And I think uh, there are a lot of other, uh, you know, components to this. Don't forget, we are not the ones uh, with this plan. It's our plan. Apparently, it's been enacted, uh, I think, reasonably, I take it, uh, uh, in the, in the uh, manner in which we have been planned it, in the, from our master plan of whatever years ago. Um, so they are, I do believe, trying to be true to that. Uh, that remains to be seen. But uh, I just think that we, we need to be a bit more cognizant because, don't forget, we have been gifted this, this component. Um, and it's our property, so you know we do need to think a little bit about that because uh, any 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 changes in the future, mm -hmm. we are we are going to subject future councils uh, to this expense at its own expense, and we do need to think a little bit around that as well because it's our. You know, I mean, if we can deliver a lot more value uh, by using those uh, using those funds in in other ways that will uh, contribute to the you know greening of our city etc well isn't that a, a wonderful outcome uh, whilst you know without necessarily having to compromise so i much uh, support this this motion as well thank you councillor canal councillor kuros talking to the deferral yes uh thank you chair um these trees hold um sentimental value to me they are um obviously going to the hospital uh, many times relatives and friends they were such so welcoming to actually have them there in front of the hospital um, but i'm trying not to look at this with emotion um, and trying to look at factual and i would prefer to actually see what they are planning on doing there and we just say it would have to be something amazing um, so i think the defer deferral would be uh, an excellent way of the community actually being properly informed because um, I think they would, it is important for them to know what it is that's going to be changed and what they're upgrading there and what, what the changes are going to be. Um, so I think the deferral was a great idea, um, but you know, it would be a really hard task to, it has to be something pretty amazing to actually agree with. Thank you, Councillor Cross. Um, Councillor Martin. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just a point of clarity. Um, uh, France raised then the matter of this being consistent with the master plan. And I did an interview on ABC Radio with France's son this morning, and he raised as well this master plan from 2011. Um, what is this master plan? And is it possible that anything in 2011 could actually show the hospital going in when in my recollection, lot 14 wasn't planned until post 2014. Mm. But the hospital, the, so is, is this something please, that is no. correct? Uh, so just, no, well, Councillor Fennell, uh, Councillor Martin, with the deferral, we expect that that information will be provided to council members. So there is such a thing, yes, to answer your question, there is such a thing uh, as a previous council position around the boulevard on the North Terrace. Um, that and this was is not, going to put you Correct. So I remember that personally, um, and that is exactly what the Lord Mayor is trying to achieve by achieving that deferral to receive all that information and be presented to council members for them to make an informed decision, understanding the historic significance of the master plan as well. All right. Well, look, I, I, I don't agree. I, look, I, I think I, no, and it, it, it defies reason to believe that the 2011 plan is going to show a boulevard uh, that is compatible with the Lot 14 development, which wasn't announced till post-2014. Sure. This, this is a furphy. And in my view, deferring the matter so that we can have a look at all of the information, um, 
allows for the opportunity for us to say, well, look at that plan, and here's a really good reason why we can chop these trees down, because it's consistent with a fabulous master plan. The truth of the matter is, there has been a decision made. Uh, the Minister, uh, Francis Sun, said to me on radio... This Councillor, morning, please, um, to use uh, proper terms, uh, Councillor Canole is an elected member of the local city. Uh, Minister Canole is an elected member for the state, so you need to oh, sure. represent well, together. I'm just saying to no, you I know what Francis you're saying, Councillor, but in this meeting, being professional, please stick to those notes. Okay. Um, anyway, look, we're allowed to be disrespectful. No, I'm, 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 I'm telling you how I would like this meeting run. Councillor Moran, no one is interrupting you. Please do not interrupt anyone. Please. Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Please sum up. Okay. The, the minister who is asking uh, for this decision to be made and I make no reference to any relative. Thank you. The minister who is asking us to make this decision made it clear on radio today that it was about creating a vista that would support the redevelopment. That is the reason. He's made that very clear. So deferring this matter to receive more information means getting information about what it's going to look like, look like in order to be able to justify it. Would you like more time, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Can I seek Can leave? No. no. I uh, need to see a show of hands, seek leave for Councillor Martin. I did interrupt him, so I've got one, two, three, four. Councillor Martin, you voting? Oh, yeah, sure. Five. Against seeking leave, one, two, three, four, five, six. Councillor Martin, you don't have leave from Council to speak. Defeated by Team Adelaide again. I voted for you, Councillor, so I hope you can exclude me sometimes from life. Um, um, Chair, the, is there no provision in standing orders where I am interrupted by others, including the Chair, and my time is denied me to allow me to finish my debate? Uh, is that...? I, I don't recall me interrupting your answer to your question. I, I interrupted you because you referenced something incorrectly, and the standing orders clearly say how we talk to each other in this chamber, and I don't think you were conducting yourself appropriately. And that's why I interrupted you, Councillor. Did you well, ask a question? Huh? Councillor Moran, I'm not speaking to you right now. Look, I... I Councillor Martin, I the decision's been made, it's final. I feel gagged. Yeah. That's fine, oh, I appreciate you. that. Speak to speak to us about it, if you wish. Uh, Councillors, anyone else would like to speak? Councillor Dunn. I'm happy to support the deferral because I think this provides us with an opportunity to review the master plan and clearly rectify the negligence of poor transport planning and see if we can get a separated bikeway uh, going up and we can use those trees and leave them there as a buffer. Win. So quite happy to support the deferral. Let's see what we get. Thank you, Councillor. Any other council would like to speak to the deferral motion? For or against? Be it there's none, I'll hand back over to the Lord Mayor to sum up. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I would also uh, like an undertaking that we actually can have a look at the master plan and also understand what was done while that part of the boulevard was done up in the first place, which was not that long ago, um, and have a look at what the intention is um, uh, around the lot 14. Um, understanding that the hospital, everybody knew the hospital was moving even back in 2011 when we were doing the master plan. You summed up. up. Summed up. So I put that to the vote. All those in favour of deferral. All those against. That is carried. Oh, oh, I move on to regressive. item 7.2, uh, City of Adelaide submission, uh, South Australia's housing, homelessness, and support strategy. <laughs> Councillors, you have a recommendation before you. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Moved. Do I have a seconder for that recommendation? Seconded by Councillor Kuros. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak to the recommendation? No. Councillor Kuros. Any questions to our administration? Councillor Hyde. Uh, I wish to move an amendment. <laughs> okay. Do we have that amendment of our no, I haven't sent it through, but let me give this a read. So I'll give you a minute. Mm. Next time, please have your amendment ready and yes, send the secretary. Yes,
Uh, just at the end of uh, two, um, uh, uh, excluding uh, point one, all of point one under strategic intent. What page was that? Yeah. What, what, what? Uh, that would be page 115 and 116. Those aren't whole pages though, so. Excluding what, sorry? Excluding all of point one under strategic intent. So that's all of the reference to the uh, Grant Institute report. So all of one and... So let me, let me get, councillors, let me get you clarity on this. So councillor Hyde has moved an amendment to the <coughs> existing recommendation to exclude point one. I'll give you a minute to reference page 115 on your papers. So if you uh, were to go there. 116. Uh, 116, sorry. 116 is what just yeah. Yeah. And um, on page 116, Councillor, do you, that's clear to everyone? <laughs> Lips, is everyone clear on what's being proposed in the way of an amendment? Allow me to clarify. No, no, no. Councillor, before you do that, uh, does anyone want to second this current amendment in its current form? I need to know what is it. So, yeah. so now that I've got Councillor Abrams seconding you, please speak to the motion. Thank you. Um, just to just to put everyone um, at ease, uh, looking at this, uh, this is a largely uh, a very good body of work. But I do think um, this first point, referring to the Grant Institute. Um, uh, is not necessarily relevant to the submission, and I don't think we should be putting it forward to the state government. Um, uh, this uh, report largely looked to address housing affordability in the eastern states, so it's not particularly relevant here in South Australia, I don't believe. Um, but just rolling through, I don't think any of the recommendations that we're uh, putting forward to the state government will be taken on board um, at all. And of course, I draw councillors to the first recommendation that's mentioned in that recommendation three. State governments should broaden land taxes to include owner-occupied housing. So if anyone on this council wants to tacitly endorse the state government putting land taxes on people's primary residence, oh, then uh, then please go down that path and see what happens. Um, uh, moreover, though, moreover, though, one, 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 Land taxes, it's, it's, it's the scary, first yeah. one. It's the first one, recommendation three. Um, so I, I challenge you to take that one to your rate payers and see what they thought about it. Um, uh, broadly speaking, there aren't necessarily issues with all of those state government recommendations, um, other than, of course, uh, it being sort of well outside of our purview. But um, uh, I would just say as well, knowing, of course, that we are, we are making a submission on this policy, um, uh, to the state government, of course, there are lots of Commonwealth government recommendations in that report as well, which we're also tacitly endorsing. Um, uh, the Commonwealth Government should limit negative gearing and reduce the capital gains tax discount. Um, of course, uh, the Government won't be doing that until they change. Um, the Commonwealth Government should include more of the value of high priced homes in the asset uh, in the age pension asset test. So if North Adelaide councillors want to go to their pensioners up there and say we're going to uh, we're going to change that, um, then I encourage you to try that one out as well. Um, uh, and see how that goes down with your ratepayers. Um, of course, there's another one, recommendation five, should develop an explicit population policy. We now have that, um, uh, at least. Uh, Commonwealth government should enforce laws covering foreign investment in residential real estate, um, uh, which they do now as well, and there's somewhere in the region of $100 million worth of real estate that the Commonwealth government has forced the sale of. Um, so those are largely irrelevant as well. That's why uh, I think, uh, again, relevant mostly to the eastern states, that's why I think this should just be taken out. And I do think in doing so, it'll make this, uh, this submission, which as I said, is largely an excellent body of work, um, uh, a lot shorter. And I think uh, uh, the guts of it, the most interesting things being at the end, I think the people that will be reading it um, uh, will be more interested in it and will have their attention for longer and it will have a greater impact. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Ramsey as a seconder. Uh, more right Thank you. So I've got Councillor Sims' hands up. Councillor Sims, you're speaking to the amendment. Uh, well, I like just wanted to ask some questions and clarification. If that's sure. Right. With regards to the amendment. Yeah. yeah. Could, could I just um, firstly clarify the scope exactly of what's being um, removed here? I'm understanding that what you're taking, proposing to take out is the bottom of page 114 uh, under housing affordability reimagining the Australian dream up until uh, point two, is that right? So the full point. 
Is that what's being removed? Correct. So, okay, so the first half of page 116 as well, and all of page 115. Correct. Okay. And um, could I just ask administration the uh, rationale around um, referencing the um, Grattan uh, report, and then I'll, I'll make some comments. Uh, through the chair, um, the the reason why that was included um, really was just to alert the um, the task force um, that there is a raft of um, research, current research, um, which contains quite a lot of um, information about housing affordability in general, and that it really is a complex interrelationship of policy settings. Um, and those things either directly or indirectly influence our housing affordability. So it's in the context, really. Mm. Um, and so I referenced that one and also the uh, Huri reports. So there's, um, there's another couple of reports that are following that. Look, I, I don't um, support the um, amendment, and that's not to say that I necessarily endorse everything that is in the Grattan um, Institute report, um, but if you read the document, it doesn't actually say that we're endorsing um, the recommendations of the Grattan Institute. It simply says these are things you may or may not um, want to consider. What I like about um, the Grattan um, Institute recommendations is that they do uh, highlight areas of um, contemplation, not only for state government, but also for the federal um, government. Um, and, you know, I'd urge councils not to uh, adopt scare campaigns in relation to um, specific um, recommendations, because we're certainly not um, advocating for the government to implement all of these. We're just saying these are things you um, may or may not want to look at. I think that makes sense um, when you're putting together a, um, a report like this. So I'd urge people not to, um, as I say, get caught up in scare campaigns. Um, no one is, is going after people's family homes. It's a report highlighting recommendations that have been uh, made by an independent um, body that's simply bringing these matters to the attention of, um, of state government. But I do think it's important that we have um, an emphasis on federal government as well and the role that they can play um, in, uh, in dealing with this issue. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Councillor Kerr, followed by Councillor Martin, followed Thanks. by the Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, um, I'm in favour of the amendment put forward by Councillor Hyde. Um, I don't think it's a scare campaign. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's a scare campaign at all. It's simply pointing out... Uh, Councillor Kuros, please. Councillor Kerr speaking. Yeah, sorry. Uh, look, it's not a scare campaign, um, but it is pointing out the fact that we have got uh, essentially uh, recommendations. I mean, if we are just putting these in here and saying these are not recommendations, well, there's lots of other reports by lots of other bodies that we could put in uh, uh, points from. But the Grattan Institute uh, is is a think tank with a particular ideological uh, bent and flavour, and, and that's fine. But we ought to be really careful in putting in uh, a document that we want to be taken seriously. We don't want to give an excuse for this to be just thrown out right at the outset. I think that what Councillor Hines has proposed is eminently sensible. You've got a recommendation here that state governments should broaden land taxes to include owner-occupied housing. This is highly contentious stuff. Uh, and I think that, uh, that excising this section alone will do a great deal of good for, for the document and its prospects in general. Thank you, Councillor Kira. Councillor Martin. Uh, look, Chair, I'm um, uh, in two minds about this. Um, uh, I can see that, uh, and, and it is to me largely uh, an ideological thing that uh, the Council is proposing here, but uh, it does strip out uh, some of the serious considerations that the Grapple Institute has, been, uh, has given to renters' rights. And it also um, uh, um, doesn't allow us to point out to the state government that there are things worth uh, looking at, including um, encouraging greater density in inner and middle ring suburbs, uh, releasing more green land, uh, greenfield land, um, additionally reforming property taxes to improve affordability, amending uh, uh, tenancy laws to make renting attractive, Commonwealth Government recommendations with regard to um, the value of high-priced homes and age pension asset tests, enforcing foreign investment in residential real estate, explicit population. Th these things are all out the window. But at the same time, we are removing from there a recommendation that the, uh, the committee has a look at the state government's current review of land tax. 
um, suggesting that there might be, in brackets, a positive impact on housing affordability. And uh, clearly, I'm happy to see that reference go because um, that uh, um, is an odious thing. But uh, look, on balance, I think this is a um, uh, an amendment that sort of guts the document. Um, and my only concern is that we are then silent on housing affordability, which is essentially uh, the subject matter of the state government's um, housing, homelessness and support strategy. Um, I think it's a, uh, a step too far and um, uh, we are left then with simply comments in relation to uh, policy and practice, social housing as infrastructure, um, Aboriginal housing, which is important, but um, it is a very weak document then, gutted in effect. So I won't be voting for this, and I, I do recommend that people think about this seriously. It is merely a suggestion that the task force might look at these things rather than um, any statement of, of adherence to any of the matters that are raised. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, councillors, I think it was the Lord Mayor to speak next. Lord, Lord Mayor speaking to the uh, amendment. Yeah, thank you. Um, look, I, I'm also a little bit uh, unsure. I mean, mainly because the paragraph on, the, on page uh, 115, 115, sorry, um, notes that the others underlined as above may be worthy of further uh, investigation blah, 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 considered, acted on or avoided, but it doesn't actually say which ones we think should be considered, like avoided or acted on, if you know what I mean, like, so, um, uh, and some of those I, I wouldn't support and some of them I would, so um, uh, I think we've got uh, two others that are referenced and then some areas for explanation. So I don't, I don't think it necessarily weakens the document. I'm sure they can, they've done their research anyway, looking at what, we, what uh, uh, what's out there? So, just as a, I'm just not sure that the the really goes back to the point of putting it in. If we're not going to explicitly say we think these should be acted on, we think these should be dismissed. <coughs> you know. So. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Any other remarks from councillors? Councillor. Thank you, Chair. I don't support the uh, removal because these are headline points from a very in-depth document. And if you actually read the Grattan report, um, some of the points that are made within this around property tax reform point to it being a very equitable, a very fair form of, of reform that should be considered. And something to the effect of if $2 are, are put toward um, every $1,000 $1, worth of unimproved capital value, it raises seven billion dollars. So it is something that should be at the very least considered and I think it should certainly be included within this document which is just giving some points uh, for consideration and it is by no means a directive of course. Thank you councillor. With that, councillor Hyde, sum up. Yeah, um, just quickly, uh, uh, yeah, I did, um, according to Lord Mayor's comments, take take issue with sort of, I call it a tacit endorsement of some of the recommendations, but then also... Lord Mayor, Councillor Donovan, please. Cherry picking those Councilor. recommendations, but then saying, oh, no, no, but you should look at these ones. Um, uh, uh, moreover, though, uh, uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take aim at the land tax stuff because um, we'll go, be going down the rabbit hole there. But um, yeah, I would just say to Councillor Martin's point, I don't think this actually weakens the document. I think it actually strengthens the credibility of the document um, uh, insofar as people will be picking it up and uh, the first thing that they read won't just be us regurgitating someone else's um, work and saying we agree with this. Uh, if you look at it, the business end, the business end, the actual things that we're saying to them around what they should be doing, um, and what we're saying the City of Adelaide might be interested in participating in is actually at the end of the document. Um, uh, and uh, as far as the, the two, other, uh, two other reports, I think they're, I think they're very good. Um, uh, two other parts that are referenced to me. So um, on that basis, uh, I'd encourage us to just uh, slim this document down a little bit, streamline it, and uh, I think it will be taken well um, uh, by the people considering it. Thank you, Councillor Hyde, for that. Uh, all those in favour of the amended, amendment put by Councillor Hyde, all those against, that is carried.
Okay, moving on to item 7.3. Oh, sorry, that was the amendment. Can I uh, have... Uh, now we'll just go, go to substantive, substantive. Any further comments with regards to this? Be it that there's no customer and sum up? No. Okay, I'll put that to you. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Uh, sorry, councillors, just to be clear. Um, all those in favour of the substantive? All those against? Excellent. Thank you very much. That's carried. Okay, move on to item 7.3, the BMX precinct city dirt master plan. We have a recommendation before us. If I can have a councillor move. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Seconded by Councillor Dunham. Councillor Moran, do you wish to speak? Uh, just recommend the uh, recommendation. Councillor Dunham. Just to thank uh, the staff who have done all the work of uh, the background toward this. It was a fascinating read and uh, thank you very much and absolutely to endorse the recommendations. Thank you very much. Councillors, anyone wish to, to speak against the recommendation? Okay, be it that there's none. Councillor Moran, sum up. Sum up. I'll put that to you. All those in favour? All that against? Councillor Martin, are you voting? Yeah, I did vote. Mentally voted. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Councillor. Okay, moving on to item 7.4, the Public Art Action Plan 2019. We have a recommendation for this committee to approve and note. Um, can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Moran, seconded by the Lord Mayor. Any discussion, Councillor Moran? Uh, me. Lord Mayor. Um, only once again to say it's a great piece of work. Um, I went through it with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> um, and uh, it's great to see us taking our public art so seriously for the city. And hopefully, if we deliver on all of this, the city's going to look magnificent. Excellent. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, I, I agree. It's a great piece of work. Um, and I think it's a sensational recommendation that. Um, uh, we have a vision for a City of Adelaide um, uh, public art festival, um, whatever it costs, it's worth it. Uh, and I welcome that, that commitment. But I do remain a bit disappointed uh, about the Council's commitment to spend just 1.3% of uh, the total capital work program on commissioning public art. It should be much higher. And, um, and perhaps the Lord Mayor may be able to use her influence to encourage the administration to increase that to 1.5, 2%, whatever, uh, that would be a really fine gesture. Um, just one issue under the uh, objective uh, for uh, uh, memorials. Uh, uh, um, can I just ask a quick question too? The operating guidelines are called guide, uh, uh, draft guidelines. Why, why are they draft? Thank you, through the chair. Um, because they sit under CEO delegation, and so that's why we're bringing them here tonight for committee to note them, and also therefore to make the recommendation to council to note them. Um, and as a result of that, then CEO will approve them. Oh, so you can feel them. Okay, that's fine. Look, there, there is um, an issue on page 228 on. Uh, uh, memorials. We, we almost consign all of them to the park banks by saying uh, that um, they must have an impact on the parklands, when in fact memorials can be in any part of the city. And I just wonder whether we ought to replace the word parklands with the city, which includes the parklands. Um, and uh, additionally, um, uh, there's a detailed uh, plan in there for the management and uh, maintenance of uh, memorials. But the guidelines are pretty silent on who pays for the maintenance. And I know that can be substantial. In fact, we, re, we, we approved a uh, Vietnamese boat people memorial recently. And part of that approval, even though it's been contested since by the, uh, the donors, part of that was an allocation for maintenance, which was at the order of $1,500,000. Yeah. So um, we're silent on that, and yet every time a memorial Council, let's just correct that information for you. I've got yeah, sure. acting CEO here. Can we pause the time, Councillor Martin, please? Well, that's very kind of you, Chair. Yeah. You can do that more often. I'm very so, diplomatic today. Um, I was just uh, heard you say that the donors, the Vietnamese, are contesting a part of the project. Could well, I've been lobbied. I don't know about anyone else. Okay. No. Okay. 
<laughs> no, we didn't. Councillor? Yeah. Uh, thank you, I can resume. Um, so I, I know there's a fairly substantial cost in maintaining these memorials. If we suddenly, over a period of 10 years, get 10 of them, then that's, a, that's an impost on the ratepayers. Is it not something that we ought to consider as being discretionary? That is to say, um, the city would normally require the maintenance uh, of memorials to be considered in any proposal, but um, you know, has the flexibility to, um, to waive those in certain circumstances. Um, that's just feedback. Uh, but look, uh, otherwise, um, I think that's great. Thank you, Councillor Larty. Councillors, any other remarks? Be it none, Councillor Moran to sum up. Summed up. Summed up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That item's carried. Members, we move on to item 7.5, Splash Adelaide 2.0. I have a recommendation before you to note and authorise. Can I have a mover, please? Move by the Lord Mayor. Seconder. Seconded by Councillor Kuros. They're quick on the buzz. Welcome back, Councillor Kuros. Lord Mayor. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I think that uh, this is a great start. I know that um, having spoken to Noni and the team that, that uh, they're going to bring this to life as soon as possible. And um, I really look forward to seeing what the community comes forward with. I know that we did over 600 events in the last iteration, which all came from the community as well as our own uh, curation to make sure that we could test and challenge. Uh, different things and pilot things and I think it's um, a really exciting time for the city to be able to do this. Thank you, Nani. It's great work. Thank you. Order. Councillor Kuros. Yeah, I just want to say that I'm really excited about uh, this going ahead and uh, bringing life uh, into Melbourne Street and, and O'Connor Street and Hutt Street as well. Um, not forgetting it um, at all, Councillor Hyde. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the, the work that you put into it and I really look forward to uh, seeing the activations uh, across our city. Thank you, Councillor Cross. Any further comments, councillors? Okay, Councillor, sorry, Councillor Norman, go ahead. Just a quick question, Chair. Um, how, once we authorise, assuming that goes ahead, what's the envisaged uh, process from here. I know how Splash worked last time, um, but how are the projects going to be chosen and how will it roll from here? Uh, through the chair, um, the it'll be a two, if I can use this term, prong approach. Um, so the first will be um, doing some light curatorial activations alongside businesses and community within Melbourne Street, O'Connell Street, um, and we'll start to look at the Hutt Street precinct as well. Um, we'll be putting, um, I suppose, a splash hub, um, which will be a creative place for us to engage with the community and businesses to start to talk about their ideas and what they would like to see rolled out in the city. So all of that will commence um, at the start of September. Thank you. And just to follow on, if I can, too. Super quick one. And so, will that, I know last time I remember seeing a lot of it online and there was all of the online, will that similarly be invited for anyone to apply for anything or specifically focusing just on those three areas? Uh, through the chair, no, it will be anywhere in the city that people have an idea. Um, so, the um, Splash Hub that I spoke about will actually move to different parts of the city um, over sort of the next four to six months. Thank you. Lord Mayor, that's uh, Summed up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That item's carried. So I'll take you to item 7.6, Strategic Plan and Progress Report, quarter 4, 1819. Another mover. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Seconded by the Lord Mayor. Councillor Sims, do you wish to speak? No, no, no. Sorry, I wasn't seconding. You weren't seconding? Sorry. Can I have a seconder, please, to Councillor Sims' move? Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Sims? Uh, reserve my right. Councillor Hyde. Oh. Sorry? I reserve my right. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor uh, Lord Mayor, sorry. Thank you. Um, look, I'd like to move a, an amendment, um, which I did supply a bit earlier. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, look, I, there was a lot of information in there, but uh, what I was after was some more data analysis because it didn't actually tell us what we've achieved. It sort of said this is closed down, well, that's on track. Well, but I was, sorry, you have I need a second. I need a second. You can't second a Castle Hyde. 
Thank you, Councillor Kills. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so I just wanted to note this progress report, and I'm hoping that we can actually have uh, something else come in in the next couple of months, which gives us a more detailed analysis as to what we've actually achieved, so that we get a rather than saying, you know, we're on track or we're doing that, but actually tells us what we've achieved in this space uh, since 2016. Thank you very much. Thanks, well, yes, any you. further debate or discussion? Okay, moved. Oh, sorry, Councillor Dolphin, go ahead. I just have a question about um, point two of the original, which will be subsumed by this. Um, approves the closing out of the 47 remaining actions. Just noting uh, under green, um, the, I suppose the, the shift in terms of the point to work with federal and state government to provide the appropriate infrastructure and promote sustainable transport options such as public transport cycling and walking to improve the experience of commuters and reduce transport related emissions and the uh, the other point around the east-west bikeway and the north-south bikeway just in terms of how that then transitions to becoming business as usual what does that mean in terms of our our plan for east-west north-south as a deliverable uh, through the chair, the law mayor's amendment um, means that none of um, none of those actions will transfer into business as usual. There's already existing council resolutions in relation uh, to those items, and we'll continue to um, progress that work in line with existing council decisions. Okay. So, just to clarify that transition to business as usual, what does it mean for the outstanding articles? If 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 this did not go ahead and we proceeded with the approves, what does it mean to transition in terms of the deliverables that we've articulated? I can see it. They're, I guess from what I heard is just they're, they're, they're not transition. Yeah. yeah. They're, just, they're standing decisions of council, so they need to be they need to be done. Um, any further remarks or comments with that? No. Uh, we'll make some up. Summed up. I'll put the amendment to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. I'll go back to the substantive, which I believe was moved by Councillor Sims. Summed up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is also carried. Now, I'll take you to item 9.1. This is uh, to deal with item 10.1 and exclusion to the public with regards to Capital City Committee update. You missed the item. I apologise. No. Sorry, Councillor, I must have missed it on my. Yes, Council Member Discussion Forum items, my favourite part of the evening. Um, <coughs> so, members, just clearly, I've received, um, just for your benefit, some advice with regards to how we best conduct ourselves in these sessions. I'll have this circulate to you as well. Uh, Council Member Discussion Forum items, to clarify the intent of this agenda item, it is to provide a forum to bring a matter to the attention of Council Members in an informal way. It is not intended to replace the existing process for questions to be asked by the CEO outside of the meeting, um, as per the Local Government Act, or via the provisions for questions on or without notice. Um, and also, in raising an item under this provision, council members should be respectful of the listed agenda items and the need for these to be considered in a timely manner. Procedurally, the following applies. A committee member must not speak for longer than three minutes at any one time without the leave of the meeting. If leave is granted, an additional two minutes only can be given by the vote of the meeting. Notwithstanding this above, during each discussion forum, item raised by the committee member, the chair will facilitate the support and support a forum that enables all committee members, the CEO, a director, associate director or officer to participate in an open and transparent discussion and exchange of information on each item. The chair after each discussion forum item will provide an opportunity for the CEO a director, associate director or officer to identify next steps. The next steps may as well be that the CEO provides an undertaking to provide further information or suggest that the question be on brought on notice uh, to a council meeting. 
So if we're all clear on this, I'm happy to... Councillor Martin, would you like to start since you've raised the automate? Uh, yes, but the, the, the Lord Mayor has uh, had the Lord Mayor on hand in the airport. I'll pick you first, so it's uh, your turn first, Councillor. I've seen you first, so procedurally, you're the first one to go. Okay, look, thank you very much for that. Um, it would have been nice uh, to have it earlier, but can we have that distributed? I've only received it um, late at uh, about 5.30, so okay. I did ask for it. I haven't seen it later. I, look, I, I just wanted uh, uh, to bring to the attention of Council that uh, people in Rundle Mall peacefully protesting the uh, Chinese government's attempts to curb judicial rights in Hong Kong uh, appear to have been harassed by Chinese government supporters. Now, um, it's not clear whether those uh, people doing the harassing are agents of the, Hong Kong, uh, the Chinese government or whether they're inspired by something else. but. It is not acceptable behaviour for uh, demonstrators in in our city to be harassed for essentially exercising the democratic right to protest. And, and further, um, there have been uh, Chinese government supporters taking photographs of the uh, the protesters. Um, and the suggestion that those photographs may find their way back to China with consequences for the families of demonstrators. That is not acceptable either. Um, and indeed, uh, it's uh, something that I think that we as a city need to make clear. Um, that is that we do not support such harassment. We do not so support such behavior. And I'd ask the administration uh, because we have community safety officers around uh, Rundle Mall at all times, or a lot of the time anyway, that uh, if they witness this kind of harassing behaviour, this kind of intimidating tactic, such as taking photographs, reported uh, to the police. And I, I think uh, it would be really good also if we as a council could send a strong message uh, to uh, Chinese investors who come to this city to understand that we as a city support the rights of visitors, uh, residents and citizens to protest in a peaceful manner about anything they wish without being harassed or in some way um, uh, intimidated. Thank you, Councillor Martin, for bringing that to our attention. Um, there is no response from this question at this stage. I think our, our safety officers circulate more regularly. Mm -hmm. right. Absolutely, there's already existing um, security as well, but uh, Rundamore Precinct um, Authority um, supplies and of course SAFEL as well, but I'll certainly follow up and find out some further information based on um, your comments tonight, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Lord Mayor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to read something out. So uh, it, it's with great sadness that I learned of the passing of former South Ward Councillor and Hunt Street business owner, Anthony Williamson, Tony. Um, he was a passionate and considerate City of Adelaide elected member from 2010 to 2014 and a dedicated and caring physiotherapist who had his practice on Hunt Street for 30 plus years. Tony lived to make the world a better place. He'll be greatly missed and our thoughts are with his family and friends. And I foreshadow that we will bring a motion to express our condolences before council next week. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Very, very well said. Um, Councillors, anyone else? Thank you. We'll move on to item nine. Exclusion to the public item 9.1 dealing with item 10.1 capital city committee update if i can have someone move the exclusion thank you councillor moran seconded by councillor hyde any discussion councillor moran summed up i'll put that to the vote all those in favor all those against that is carried um, if i'd ask please members of the public um, that are not directly related to this item and council staff to please exit the camera light center thank you very much camera light room if I can have someone please assist by closing the door.
7.37 p.m. and I thank you for your attendance.